morning. There is no commercial support for today's activity. The speaker and planners have disclosed no relevant financial relationships with any commercial interests. You will receive a SurveyMonkey link after today's activity. If you are viewing online, the evaluation link will be listed in the links icon at the bottom of the screen. If you have a question, please enter in the Q&A chat and we will ask at the end of the presentation. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Odom. Dr. Odom is board certified in general surgery and has a wide range of medical interests. His expertise includes repairing large hernias and he sees patients from all over the state. His practice was founded in 1994 along with Dr. Mark Blinkenship. He served as president of the medical staff at St. Joseph's Candler Hospital and is a member of many professional societies, including Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society. Training the next generation of surgeons is a priority for Dr. Odom. He has been named Teacher of the Year at the Medical College of Georgia three times and was instrumental in bringing the mastery of General Surgery Fellowship to St. Joseph's Candler Hospital. Dr. Odom grew up in rural Georgia and attended Georgia Southwestern College, where he majored in zoology. He went to medical school at the Autonomous University of Guadalajara and finished his medical training at the New York Medical College. Dr. Odom also completed fellowship training in trauma surgery at Rutgers University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Odom. Today I'm gonna to talk about what you're doing now and what you might be doing after you leave here. I'm going to talk about the surgical shortage in Georgia. I'm going to talk about my fellowship program. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of my disenchantment and disdain with medical education today. Uh, I've been an educator for 35 years, I'm a, I'm a private practitioner first, but my whole practice life, I've been teaching medical students, residents, and fellows. So it's sort of a side hustle. Now, I've never taken one dime for doing that, and you know why I don't do that? Because I can say anything I want to say, okay? <laughs> I like the freedom to be able to say anything I want to say. And I'll tell you today that I might say things that you might disagree with or that you might not like, but those things are based on my truths, right? And my truths are a long experience in doing this stuff as an academic, a private practitioner, or whatever. Uh, and these are the things I believe. Right? If somebody disagrees with them, that's fine. Disagreement is the spice of life. But what I'm hoping is that you can get something out of what I'm going to say that will help you down the road. There's a bad shortage of general surgeons in Georgia. All right. So I put that up there. Right? Not so fast. Between the idea and the reality falls a shadow. And that's becoming a good surgeon. I like to put that up there. You know why I like to put that up there? Because that's what they put up at the University of Georgia Law School when you start your law degree. Dr. Strom, Dr. Royal, it's no, it's no surprise to me that in Savannah, if I have a patient with a stubbed toe and I get sued, I have a 60% chance of losing when I get to the courthouse, right? Why is that? Because lawyers are better trained than us. Why are they better trained with us? Because they still use the Socratic method. When they come into the law school, they put that up there and the governor and all the alumni, senators walk out, the judges, and they go, welcome, good and faithful servant, you have arrived. Then for the next three years, they have a number in class they all go to class. How many people went to class every day in medical school without fail? Raise your hand. Hey, I'm surprised. I'm surprised. My students get their education off Wikipedia. <laughs> I'm very serious. I had to read big books. Dr. Strom had to read great old big books and mean men 
uh, tutored her through those books. That's not how it is today. So, yeah, so our adversaries get called on in class. A professor walks up there and says, Mr. So-and-so, seat so-and-so, stand up and explicate the case that I had you study last night. Yeah, they, they prepare their kittens to catch mice. Us, I don't think we're doing that quite that good. Uh, I've had many interesting students in my day. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I like to have people that are pre-meds come to me, and a lot of them do, and I make them make me two promises. A, that you won't quit, and B, that you'll do everything I say. And it's been a pretty good formula because I've gotten some very unlikely people into school. <laughs> very unlikely. <laughs> well, who knows who this guy is? Anybody know? Come on, Dave. Come on, Devin. Yeah, I beat his butt for eight years, Dr. Royal. He lived with me and... Uh, I found him in the woods as a veritable savage in a breech clout. That's your granddaddy. That's everybody. If you say the word general surgery, orthopedic surgery, urology, plastic surgery, that's your granddaddy. That's who started our surgical education system in this country. He was a genius. He was also tragically flawed. You know, back in them days, being a genius trumped tragically flawed. Today, not flawed trumps genius, right? So things are a little bit different today than they were then. We all trace back to this guy. We all, if you're sitting in this room, you have a pedigree. You're supposed to be a purebred. We have to act like purebreds, right? Hey, Dr. Royal. Thank you, brother. Yesterday, Devin Smith picked me up wearing a necktie. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Royal. Thank you for respecting our traditions. Thank you for teaching these little kids how to, how to hunt. The day one of my patients sees me out of my necktie will be a cold day in hell. <laughs> I got taught that through a long tradition in New York City. I'm a physician. I'm a doctor. You ain't, you ain't seeing me wearing no pajamas, baby. I ain't going to be down in the Kroger looking through the lettuce wearing no scrub suit. Sorry, guys. I'm a little bit better than that. <laughs> or at least I got to puff up like a porcupine and make my patients think I'm bigger than that. So we all trace back to this guy. All right, I didn't do Dr. Royal, I did Dr. Strom, okay? If you're a resident here today, she's your mammy, okay? So we can go right back on her genealogy. Now, she trained at Emory University when there was a guy named Dean Warren, right? I believe that would be correct. Now, Dean Warren was famous in my day because he'd invented something called distal splenorenal shunt, right? We all wanted to be able to do that procedure. Well, now we have some tips and see you, Dr. Warren, and <laughs> you don't hear much about him anymore today. This guy you hear a hell of a lot about. <laughs> More about what he said than what he did. Uh, there's a really interesting article somebody, one of his former fellows wrote about uh, stonisms and the things that he would say. And a lot of the things that we say today in passing and we don't know who to attribute them to, he said it. Either him or a guy named Red Dukes in Houston. They, you know, all these aphorisms that we throw around that you still hear, a lot of them came from this guy. Um, he wasn't a program director at Emory. He later became one. And he was trained by this guy. I think he married his daughter. Is that not correct, Dr. Strom? He was inbred. You see, our families are inbred. We're all inbred. We all go back to this guy. 
He was trained by this guy. This guy is named Daniel Elkins, uh, if I don't miss my guess. And so this guy is in my surgical lineage. That guy's named Blaylock. Okay, so that I descend from Blaylock. You guys descend from him. Now where we met was this picture's there because Blaylock was sick because he came from Georgia, right? Halstead fired Blaylock. And uh, he later got Halstead's job. But uh, he came to Georgia and had to have his appendix out. So naturally, he goes to Emory and gets his buddy Elkins to take it out. So that's how me and Dr. Strom are related. I'll do you next time, Dr. Royal. It's easy. This internet, I hate the thing, but I got to admit, it really uh, brings up some fun things. Now, Elkin traces back to this guy. Does anybody know who this guy is? Harvey Cushing, right? Uh, in the Massachusetts general tradition. That's where Emory surgery came from. And obviously, this guy worked with Halstead. He was a brain surgeon. Uh, when Halstead offered him a job, you know why he almost didn't come? Halstead said, oh, by the way, you're going to be in charge of orthopedics. And Cushing said, that is an insult. Now an orthopedist has to walk around with AOA and can't build a birdhouse, but, you know, can describe bone physiology to you. Back then, they could only build a birdhouse. All right. <laughs> How times have changed. All right. My idea and what I'm trying to tell you why do I think tradition is important? Does anybody know? Because tradition calms me down when I'm in trouble. Having a pedigree makes me confident. I realize that I have a phalanx of history behind me, and now I'm the point of that phalanx. I am not alone. I am the product of a rich and vibrant history that goes all the way back to the Indo-European cultures, uh, the uh, Indus Valley culture, Harappa. I'm the product of 5,000 years of evolution. If you want to call me mister, that's fine. I'm a barber surgeon. I run faster, jump higher. I'm not a flea. That gives me confidence. I need confidence because I got a lot of stuff arrayed against me today. Promised I'd talk about the physician shortage in Georgia. All over the United States, there's a physician shortage. Anybody know surgeons are, and doctors in general are very poor businessmen and very poor managers. We're crisis oriented. How many crises have you been through, Dr. Strom? Not enough doctors. Oh, open the flood. Oh, Dr. Glut, run them off, close residencies. We never, ever find a happy median, and we certainly have not found one now. Uh, the country is in trouble doctor-wise. That's the only number of doctor surgeons we have in the state of Georgia, 730, not many. That's about seven per 100,000. We're 44th in the nation. That's debatable. We might even be worse. You ever heard that? Thank God for Alabama and Mississippi. <laughs> I don't know why people pick on Alabama. People would much rather go to their medical school than ours, despite the fact that they have only two-thirds our tax revenue. <laughs> eh? But we do. Distribution's terrible. Look where they are. They're all in Atlanta. They're all in Atlanta. They're not out here. Hey, that's why the state gave this nice, beautiful hospital the money to train you. Yeah, you're, you're part of the solution to this problem. You're, you, they're looking to you to try to, try to uh, help out with this problem. And I think you're going to do it. Look how old we are. Me and Dr. Strom rule. <laughs> <laughs> We're old. What you think about that, Boomer? <laughs> We're old. We're wore out. We're gone. We're history. Caputo. 
and there's, <laughs> and there's not enough of you to fill our ranks. Sorry, but good for you. You've arrived. Only 10 to 15 percent elect to do general surgery. Uh, I like to talk about surgery manpower hours versus numbers of surgeons. I'm going to get into that. Uh, how many girls I got out there? How many girl residents? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Oh, you're underrepresented. It's usually about 50%, maybe more in some programs today. Listen, I love my girls. Uh, my girls match better. My girls do better. My girls work harder, jump higher, and fly faster. They do. I, I swear to God, Dr. Royal, I, they, they, they're, a lot of these girls are tough. Uh, problem is, they don't generally translate to as many manpower hours after leaving residency. And I didn't make that up, and I'm no misogynist. I'm the father of two daughters that I love dearly and wish they'd be surgeons, but they aren't going to be. <laughs> I spoiled them. But the idea is the shift to more girls in surgery has decreased traditional manpower hours. I've been going to a rural county for 33 years. That's my favorite place to practice right there in the whole world because people don't bother me. I go there two days a week, and I have for 33 years, and there I am doc. I treat everything. I treat everything under the sun. I am doc. That is my happy place. That is where I like to practice. I don't like to practice in my white tower. I like to practice there. Oh, but there's a few problems. Look at my population. Look at my poverty level. Do you know how many people I have in Scriven County with that Cadillac insurance? You know what I'm talking about, not strong. Cadillac insurance. That insurance that supports our decaying health care system today. The money. Only about 10 or 15 percent which extrapolates to fewer than 5,000 people that are insured in that county. The hospital I work in in Savannah hires 5,500 people, all with Blue Cross Blue Shield. So I'm in a better hunting ground if I never leave my hospital than I am if I go to this rural area. But that's where I like to go. I like to practice medicine there but I make my money in Savannah. And I'm going to talk about that. Oh boy, years ago the goose hung high. There was an act in Georgia all over the United States called the Hilburton Act. This was in the late 60s, early 70s where the government built all these little county hospitals in all our, what, 170-something counties. They worked perfectly well. Most of them had a general surgeon who set fractures, fixed hips, did thoracic surgery, took out parotid glands, cut off legs, go help the GYN or the family practice guy deliver a baby. They were full service hospitals. Now they cannot afford a Da Vinci robot. They are going under left and right. And that's a whole nother discussion, but uh, their economic vitality in these communities depend on a hospital. When, a, when an industry comes to these counties, they get school, yes, check mark. A uh, 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 Japanese restaurant with sushi, no, well, all right, we'll overlook that one. Hospital, yep, check. They don't have a hospital, they don't get that check mark. So that was a vibrant hospital, but now there's problems. Rindle is crying. Okay, so only a few go into general surgery. Our medical schools had a raft of the last 20 years of taking everybody from Atlanta. Who's from Atlanta? I got nothing against Atlanta, brother. There's just other towns in Georgia, you know what I'm saying? When the um, House Appropriations Committee asked one of the deans in uh, 
Augusta why he wasn't fulfilling their pledge to put more doctors in rural areas. The answer was, well, Senator, it's very difficult to get these guys to live in Hayhira. To which the senator replied, not if they're from Hayhira. Okay? I don't know why everybody uses Hayhira and Alabama as, I like Hayhira. <laughs> uh, unaffordable advances in technology. These little hospitals can't keep up technologically. Guess what? We spend 18.5% of our per capita income on health care. One day we're going to run out of money. Maybe somebody that knows how to practice in a rural area when you're out of money might do better. Uh, I, I, this is a new talk, Dr. Strom and Dr. Royal. I, I've been talking about my trip to the Ukraine and things like that. Uh, I, I've been in the healthcare system in the Ukraine that the whole hospital, 600 beds, made due on $4 million a year. And I didn't see any unhappiness with their health care. Uh, a lot of you guys might want to do big cases. I hope you do. I would not leave my, I would not take my diploma until Dr. Royal had taught me how to do a Whipple procedure. I may never do one, but I, I wouldn't call myself a surgeon if I couldn't scrub that case. I know, Dr. Royal, they shouldn't be running around doing Whipples. We're all super specialized, but back in me and Dr. Strom's day, that was where you were going to be a loser or a winner. Could you scrub the Whipple? If you were one of the half of the graduates that could scrub the Whipple, you were going to be a big surgeon. If you wasn't, you were going to be a tinkerer, right? A tinkerer. You know what a good surgeon is? A good surgeon is a guy who knows how to do the case. A great surgeon is a guy that knows how to fix his own complications. Strive to be a great surgeon. You can do it if you set your eye on it. Don't be a piddler. Don't go to your first interview and say, well, what kind of case? Oh, I just want to do bread and butter. Oh, so you're undertrained. <laughs> That's exactly what you're telling them. Don't you guys agree? When I go and tell somebody that at an interview, we all want to do uh, insured gallbladders and hernias. That's, that's good money. But they just ain't enough of them. I took them all out. You're going to have to wait for them to grow some more. <laughs> All right. Losing ownership of your patient. Uh, transferring people. All these doctors in town today are hired by the hospital. They don't want you to send them their patient. Right? Man, you dumb Rube Goldberg. Who wants to hear that? Isolation and loss of educational opportunities. You know, I have a big practice. I have probably, uh, somebody told me one time I had the biggest single uh, specialty surgery practice in the state. Well, well, I don't depend on patients from Savannah. I go around and meet the rural surgeons and I buddy up with them. And uh, I talk to them. Lack of confidence in reach graduates. Now, I'm not talking about people not having confidence in you. They all do. They, the public still has confidence in us. I don't understand why, but they do. I'm talking about confidence in yourself. If you leave here and you're not able to say, I feel confident, or at least I know how to fake confidence. Me and Dr. Strom were no braver than you. We just knew how to fake it better. That's the truth. This is the biggest problem I hear today. Poor support services, not having GI, not having interventional radiology. I would say half my transfers are to get an ERCP or a drain and abscess. I don't know what y'all's experience are, but that's what I have to accept from rural areas. Social disparities resulting in sicker patients with greater comorbidities that require transfer. 
These are some patients. I mean, I just went through my phone and just took lymphedema, right? This is Scraven County. Okay, never say this to a patient. Well, if it don't bother you, don't bother it. That's got to be one of the stupidest things you can ever tell a patient. It's almost as stupid as yours is the worst I've ever seen. Right? That is crazy. That, that's this is a rural patient who the people kept saying, well, if it don't bother you, don't bother it. That is a common hernia that I fix. These are, that one ain't from a rural area. That one's from the Medical College of Georgia. Them old trauma boys did a good job on him, didn't they? He's alive, so I guess they did. There's a head and neck cancer. Comes into my office abscessed, right? This is a few bad surgeries. What, what am I going to do with that? These, these are things I see on a daily basis. Dr. Royal, uh, I got to tell you guys, and, and I'm going to give you a hint. Keep a journal of what you do. Keep a journal of what you do every day. Write things down. My life experience today, some of the things I've done based on where I practice would be landmark papers. I've probably done 150 Nissen closures of perforated duodenal ulcers, goody powder ulcers, I call them. Right? I'm not a patobiliary surgeon, but... When I started, there weren't any, so now every time busted, they call me in the OR, and I go, I go what you going to do? So, oh, I'm just going to throw down a drain or do, put a duodenostomy tube because that's the only thing they know how to do, right? When me and Dr. Strom were kids, there wasn't any uh, Prilosec, so we did an elective stomach every week. I can do a gastrectomy in two minutes, in an hour and a half, hand sewed, and I teach people how to do it. And, and, and I've just done so many destroyed duodenums. I also did a trauma fellowship in Newark. And I learned how to take care of that when bullets went through uh, tiger country, but that helped me. But that's a Nissen closure. Who knows what it is? other than Dr. Strom and Dr. Royal. What I've done is, this is D2. That's the pancreas. The, the pancreatic duct is right here, so what I've had to do was cut the duodenum off below the ampulla of vater, and then and I asked to most the duodenum to the head of the pancreas like a Whipple procedure, right? Learn how to do a Whipple procedure. If you never do one, learn. Be comfortable in this area. Hernias, hernias, cancers. <laughs> this guy came to see me because sweat was bothering him when he cut the grass. Poor payer classes. We have to, when we, I'm, I have to be a flea. I, got, I have to look at my book, man. I have to treat all kinds of stuff out in the country. Uh, which I like. You know, in medical school, it costs you $250,000. That's a dollar for every fact you learn. I hate to forget them. I like practicing in general. And that's where I practice normally, big old white tower. That's my catchment area. Most of that is uh, hernias, right? So... I want to talk to you all about my mastery of general surgery fellowship. How much time do I have? Is anybody keeping up? Is that the, what do I got, 25 minutes left? All right. One guy is yawning. Could you get on to him later, Dr. Royal? He was on call last night. Forgive, forgive him. It was Devin. <laughs> all right. So, I had a choice of doing a residency program like you guys, and I said, well, if only 10 or 15 percent of the res take me two, three years to get one, take me five years to complete people, get them through, that's eight years, and then only 10 percent 
will become rural surgeons, so that'll give me a net value of two surgeons in 10 years. Not a very good return on, on my buck. So I started a fellowship called Mastery of General Surgery. Um, I was flooded with applicants your age, flooded with young people that had failed in practice. And they were coming from great and storied institutions. And their directors knew they were going to fail when they gave them that diploma. I opened a rehab for failed surgeons. That's not what I was trying to do. And I've gotten away from that. But it taught me a very sobering lesson about surgical education in America today. You guys have no idea how lucky you are to be here. Even my good applicants, and I'm not talking about little programs. I'm talking about big programs. I'll show you. How many cases did you do? The requisite. That's the answer. What's the requisite, Dr. Royal? 900? Huh? 850. I was in a pyramid program. It took me nine years to become a general surgeon because they kept firing me for good reason. Some days I showed up without a necktie. Them old boys was serious. And they were mean to me to keep others from being mean to me. Okay? We don't do that anymore. When I was you guys' age, I was too young and stupid to be responsible for my education. I don't think you guys are very much different than I was. But we're asking you today to be responsible for your own education. That's not fair. That's not fair. I'm going to show you why. Oh, and when I ask them, oh, so you did 900 cases, thereabouts, how many did you do without your attending doing anything? You know what the average answer is? 300. Oh, by the way, fellowships are becoming keen on this. I'll explain it to you later. Did I miss something? Decreasing teaching cases, right? At Memorial, we used to have a charity clinic where those were your patients and the attendant went. And one day was medicine, next day was surgery. Uh-uh. The teaching hospitals don't want indigents that we trained on. They don't, want, they don't want them in the hospital. That's where we train. Academic programs are geared toward fellowship. Well, let's kick the can down the road, right? The other day, a friend of mine in the Army, by the way, the Army programs are really good. You guys listen to Behind the Knife, Madigan Army Hospital, right? Everybody listen to that. I hope you're listening to that. That's good stuff, all right? Um, especially their in-training reviews and their board reviews, all right? So my buddy, he's out there at Fort Carson, and he's, uh, he's uh, uh, moonlighting in trauma. Nothing to him at uh, University of Colorado, Denver. Well, him and his chief resident have a bad gallbladder and the chief resident's having some problems. And he says, uh, look kid, not for nothing. You got six more months in your training. You really need to get better with a bad gallbladder. You really need to drill down on it before you get out of here. He says, by the way, what are you doing next year? He says, oh, I I'm going to do hepatobiliary. How can you, you should be able to do a Whipple when you go to a Pato Billiard. Going to that fellowship is to learn how to do a difficult one, right? Kick the can down the road. Oh, they'll get it in fellowship. 
I tell my students, if you go to a program and you ask how many cases a resident does, which better be 1,200 or you, I mean, and they say, oh, let me show you our simulation lab. Get up and leave. <laughs> if you stay here for five years and you only work 80 hours a week, God bless you. I don't, I don't have any medals to give out to you, but you're a brave soul. You're a brave soul. Go ahead, self-justify it. Tell me about burnout. All right? How about letting some other loser be the burnout? And you validate yourself by your abilities. Overemphasis on minimum. All right, you put the porch, you dock. I'll sit over here and do the case while you uh, play with, you know. Come on. <laughs> right? I, I love the Da Vinci robot. I think it's been one of the biggest detriments to teaching surgery that ever occurred in this country. <sighs> These are a list of my fellows. I'm out of the rehab business. I'm out of the rehab business, thankfully. All right, I'm into the teaching business. Not that I won't rehab a guy with a compelling story. Some people really can't help it. It's not their fault. But this is since I started in 2017. I'll show you my results, but uh, this is where my guys went. I will also tell you this, my average number of cases for my fellows is 600 per year. I've had two fellows that I got board certified that were at a third year level. So I kept them for two years. Yeah, you, you will walk out of big hospitals today at a third year level. You will, and they will board certify you. Okay. And so I kept two for two years. They did 1,200 cases. If you'll notice, I had two students, two residents, fellows that had failed to get fellowships. The only thing I changed on their application was that I was able to write, Dr. Strom, talking about my letters, this fellow will be able to cover you at night without supervision. This fellow will have done twice as many cases as any applicant on this interview cycle. Both of them got their first choice. Okay, fellowship directors know of this problem. So I've put out five general surgeons in 10 years, rather than the two that I told you I would have gotten, and I'm using man hours for that. The reason I'm using man hours for that is, is because my model, I cannot practice in a small town. I do too much complex stuff. I hate being in a big town, so I go to both. And that's what I'm throwing out to you today. Okay, I go to both. My wife doesn't want to live in Hayhira. I can't live in, so don't live there. Go there twice a week. One of the things I'm working on now with the legislature is getting you more money for loan repayment for less hours. Now it's 40 hours per week, $25,000 per year loan repayment. You'll get that, it's good money. It needs to be better money for less hours. And that's one thing. Um, this is what the government's doing. Uh, I talked about the last one. We're building new medical schools. We have a great one in Savannah we're building, and I promise you I'm going to take good students who don't burn out. I don't care where you went to college. Uh, by the way, Dr. Royal and Dr. Strom, I don't have any residency positions. Let's buddy up, right? Let's buddy up. Who knows who that guy is? 
That was a famous painting. Y'all didn't know who Halstead was, so I don't think you're going to know who that is. That's by Thomas Eakins. That's called the Gross Clinic. It used to hang in Jefferson Medical College. Uh, that's the kid's mama. Right? That's the guy, that's the scribe right there. Eakins painted himself over here. You really can't see it. But one of the things that really, that, these are controversial paintings. Uh, number one, people thought it was horrible. What we do was horrible and should be hidden. Uh, the other reason that people thought it was holler, horrible was that all the medical students back there are asleep. <laughs> Eakins was a keen observer. A few years later, he painted the Agnew Clinic. Huh? Notice the change? Listerism has come, and look at this guy. There's Devin. <laughs> There's the guy that was yawning. Guess why people objected to that one? Oh, by the way, Eakins didn't do very well in his lifetime. Now he's considered probably one of the greatest American artists. Um, why did people object to the Agnew Clinic? They objected to the Gross Clinic, then 10 years later they objected to the Agnew Clinic. Why do you think? They showed a boob. <laughs> <laughs> Times don't change. People don't change. All right. I'm sure some of you might not believe all the things I told you. Uh, and I, I'm standing here, I'm, I'm Lazarus, come from the dead, to say, hey guys, this is serious. Dr. Royal making you wear a necktie is serious. He's trying to keep these guys off of your butt. They don't care where you've been to school. They're mean bureaucrats. They're worse than the IRS. They want to drag you back into disillusionment and destroy your life. I am not joking. And we as educators are not doing you guys any favors. Yes, we were fascist. We were too mean. We, we were terribly excessive, Dr. Strom. I'm sorry. But because we were so excessive, they came in and turned us into Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. And they're trying to turn Dr. Royal into a camp counselor. Don't let them, Dr. Royal. Love these kids enough to beat the shit out of them. Right? Be a parent. Beat their ashes. Love them a little bit. <laughs> All right. No good. No good. I cannot tell you. If anybody wants, I, I can sit down right now. I hate hyperbole. I was going to say 15. Let's go with nine. I can sit right here and tell you nine horror stories of bright-eyed graduates from the best medical school and the best programs who are in trouble. One girl f sued five times her first year. Gone. Kid, I'm going to call this school, University of Michigan. He's now a nurse. This is serious. These guys right here, they don't, they're not woke. Okay, they're mean. They, they consider themselves protecting the public from you. Make sure that they don't have a case. Who is this guy? What, why, why are we here? What, what, why am I standing here talking to you guys? I, I, I just got back from Tortola. My, I got a nine-year-old daughter. She said, Dad, why should we ever leave here? And I look at her and I say, you know what? Maybe you're right. Won't you just cash out and let's stay here? Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm here because I care. 
I don't want you guys to be one of those people that get into trouble. That's Viktor Frankl. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. He learned about his meaning in a concentration camp. Uh, you know, this is not a job. Emergency medicine is a job. If you want a job, go quit today and go become an ER doctor. That's a job. Go become a radiologist. That's a job. This is not a job. This is a defining life experience. Sometimes it's not fun. You know, spiritual awakenings don't necessarily have to be fun. A person knows little of heaven until he's walked through hell. Okay? This profession will give meaning to your life if you use it for that purpose. If you use it as a job and you say, well, I'm going to find balance in my life, well, then you're going to be a shitty parent and a shitty surgeon. Okay, my kids don't like me. I think they'll cry when I die. Right? I missed all their soccer games. Blah, 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 blah. But I think I've demonstrated to them that a little guy who doesn't have much potential, if he works hard enough, can do great things. What's the better of the two lessons? I think they wouldn't like me if I'd have went to their soccer games either. I'm a handful. All right? <laughs> But, you know, it, it is what it is. I, I've had a great time at this profession, and I've used this profession to establish meaning in my life. If this is your religion, like it is mine, then you know what every day when you wake up is like? Remember the day that you opened that letter and it said you are admitted? Remember match day when it said, you have a job? That's every day you walk in the door to this hospital. Right? Learning how to turn negative into positive thinking. Yeah, if you want to feel as good as me, one day a price has to be paid. Yes, a price must be paid. You want to make big bucks? A price must be paid. Anything you got good in life, if it's worth a dime, you have to sweat blood, sweat, and tears for it. Ask yourself today, am I doing everything I can not to be one of those people? If at the end of your training you ask yourself, do I need more cases? If you find yourself in that situation, send me an application. If Dr. Strom or Dr. Royal write you a good letter, I will look upon your application favorably because I trust what they're doing here. You should as well. It's a black world out there. Thank y'all. Any questions? Do we have any questions from the audience? I can come over to you with, a, with the microphone. Raise your hand if you have a question. Let me say, how's that? <laughs> I like this girl. Don't fire her, Dr. Royal. <laughs> She's laughing at my joke. She's the only one. She's either very perverse or got an elevated sense of humor. <laughs> I don't know which. <laughs> Come on, How guys. You, ask I, me something. No. Anything. I Who's just, the why, why don't you expand a little bit on... on um, you have some of your fellows who go, go to smaller towns to work... When, when you, I mean, I've sort of, I sort of tell people when they go, I'm, if all my residents went to a smaller town, I'd be so ecstatic. It'd be awesome. But you can't go there right out of your training, even if it's after a fellowship and be the only person. You've got to have backup. You've got to have mentoring where you're going. Can you talk about that process of how that works, establishing a practice somewhere? You, you know, here's what's been working for me. Uh, I think we ought to give up trying to get young people to go live in small towns. They're just not going to do it. I'm a big believer in satellites. I'm a big believer in taking young people into big groups and satelliting them. 
and that's what I do, Dr. Strom. Uh, I like to look at hours I've put into small towns rather than bodies, right? Uh, these little Hill Burton hospitals, they don't need a full-time surgeon. They're basically becoming outpatient surgery centers, okay? That, that's what they are. They're outpatient surgery centers for nothing bigger than a gallbladder. But that's still the economic engine of the Hill Burton Hospital. So if you go to a small town and you see patients one day and do your cases, endoscopy, the next, no big whoop. The next echelon of hospitals is Vidalia, Jessup, Douglas. The, these hospitals are going to end. You are going to be a, you're a tertiary care center, right? These are going to be secondary care centers. And they normally have a couple of surgeons at them. Some of them need better surgeons, and they're horribly underserved. I, w I work with a lot of small hospitals. I worked with one the other day where they lost their vascular surgeon. He retired. That, at, that took away $4 million from their bottom line immediately. So rather than tramping out the Screven, Screven can't support one surgeon by himself, right? Look at the idea of living where you want to live and driving for an hour. What do I do during those hours I drive? Number one, I got a nice car. I like to drive. Number two, it's generally full of medical students. That's where I lecture, okay? Pardon my, tell them, Devin. <laughs> Taking a ride with me is, uh, if I fall, I might, they'll change the name of this place to Odom Hospital. <laughs> I'm in trust fall position right now. I like her. <laughs> Anyway, come on, ask me something else. And, and listen, I, I never have anybody come to visit. I can tell you, people get an idea of my program when, A, they get turned down for fellowship, or their director says, you, you don't need to go out. No, you're, you're, you're not ready to practice. You can stay here and be my PGY7 next year, and, or you can look at a mastery program. Some directors don't even have that amount of courage. They'll just let you go. Glad to be rid of you. What happens today if you're a bad student? We don't cuss you out and fire you. We just stop teaching you. Here's your certificate. Right? If you're, bad, if you're not worthy of being taught today, where we used to fire you or call you and rip you a new one, now we just stop teaching you. Don't, don't let that happen to you. Be teachable. Anything else? Yes, sir. Just, uh, I think you touched on a point that's a real challenge for younger surgeons, when you first get out, there's so much information now available at the tip of your fingers on the internet. There's so many textbooks that people write or fellows have written for their attendings. And so when you're coming across cases that you may not be familiar with, and you're trying to look it up before you see a patient or try to make a decision about doing a procedure, um, how do you counsel your, your partners or your junior fellows and finding the right resource and knowing if it's a good resource to trust before they make a patient I mean, decision. Dr. Royal, what a great question. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. I don't say maybe 40, 45 papers I've written. I still write in a lot of papers. Uh, this one right here is a paper. I don't know where it's published. I let the people write them. But I tell everybody in a joking fashion, if you happen to read one of my papers, do the opposite. You know what the hell I'm talking about, okay? The literature today is full of garbage 
written by people who often shouldn't be surgeons to see their name in print. When you see something in print, if it's not in a giant book, even some giant books, I don't like that Greenfield book. I'm sorry. It talks about 20 pages of basic science and then a vignette. Oh, we don't do gastrectomies anymore. Well, no, not in New York. You call the hepatobiliary surgeon. <laughs> I, I, I'm so distrustful of literature today that it is past funny. Okay, Dr. Royal is exactly right. You know, I called a friend of mine the other day about a student that wanted an away rotation at uh, Albert Einstein. This guy's a head of trauma. We called him McNellis the Greek. I trained with him, and we're talking. And I said, what happened to old so-and-so? He said, he's dead. I said, well, he didn't like me worth a damn. He said, newsflash, Odom, nobody liked you. I said, so we're talking. He said, how'd you learn this stuff? Now, both of us are in our 60s. I said, man, I tell you what, you remember when we went to that private hospital and that mean-ass guy down there was down there and he hated me and I got up his ass sideways and I copy everything that man did. Hated my guts. Screamed, yelled, jumped around, but he was the best surgeon there and I got up his butt sideways. I said, that's how I learned. I said, how did you learn? Two old men talk. He said, oh, you remember when that, you know where we were. He said, when they got let me out, I went to LIJ, and there was an old man that was, he was about 70 years old, and he looked like he had his shit together, so I just got on his ass till I figured it out. Both of us had graduated with over 3,000 cases. I was a PGY-9 with a fellowship. I did 600 cases as a fellow. And, I mean, and here two guys are at the end of their practice lives talking about how we learned this. Thank you, Dr. Royal. I didn't learn it. I, I got to learn the didactics from a book. That's the language. I can't go talk to Dr. Strom if I don't know something about breast chemotherapy. She'll think I'm a blithering idiot. That's the cost to get her to teach you. Right? But you know what separates me from a flea? I know how to do the operation. <laughs> we have to learn a craft. If you spend a hundred years in here learning didactics, which is important, but you miss the craft, you're doomed. You got to learn the craft. Thank you. That was a very good question. I'm with you 100%. Watch the literature. Watch who wrote it. Look at the scientific method. Evaluate the paper. We all learn how to evaluate papers in medical school. You know what's the main thing to look for? Confirmational bias. Watch out for confirmational bias in any paper you see. Why did this guy write this paper? I really enjoyed coming, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Right.